And we are live. Thank you for joining us for Black Immuno Week. Together, we are creating connections in the field of research in immunology, and together we celebrate, amplify, and support Black voices in immunology. We will be together for the next two hours. We'll be um, back to back having TEDx style talks, uh, immediately followed by a Q&A and a panel discussion with our fantastic guest speakers. Today, we will have Dr. Tony Webb, Dr. Brian Bryson, Dr. Onye Iwala, and Dr. Asher Williams. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge our major sponsor, Immune Deficiency Foundation, the patient advocacy nonprofit organization that helps countless patients in their journey with immune deficiencies. We would like to acknowledge our major sponsor, Imperial College London, one of, the, one of the most iconic research institutions in the UK, leading through innovation and passion. You can find all our contributor for Black in Immuno Week and beyond Black in Immuno Week at our, on our website, blackinimuno.org. So a little bit of housekeeping now. If you post on social media about uh, our talk today, the Immunology Technology Crossover Talks, please use the hashtag Black in Immunotech with the first letter of each word capitalized for accessibility purpose. Our presenters will be using captions with their presentation. And so you can submit questions in our YouTube live feed and on Twitter using the hashtag Black in Immunotech. A recording of this session will be subtitled and posted on the YouTube channel with transcripts separately available uh, within 24 hours of the event um, on our website, blackinimino.org. Now I'm going to introduce uh, the first guest speaker for today. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Brian Bryson. Dr. Bryson is an assistant professor of biological engineering at the Massachusetts Institutes of Technology and a member of the Ragan Institutes of Massachusetts General Hospital, MIT, and Harvard. He completed his undergraduate studies at MIT in mechanical engineering before obtaining a PhD in biological engineering at MIT. After graduate school, Dr. Bryson went to Harvard, C.H. Chan School of Public Health where he trained with Sarah Fortune and became interested in new, in new approaches to eczema and post-pathogen interaction in tuberculosis infection. Brian is, uh, is back at MIT, where he has started his own lab uh, a little bit over two years ago, focusing on bridging quantitative approaches to understand how the immune system eliminates deadly pathogens. He'll be presenting today how to learn new viral languages. Hey, Brian, how are you doing? I think you're muted. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to share with you a little bit of the work that we've been doing in our lab. So as Joelle mentioned, um, I, my name is Brian Bryson. I'm an assistant professor in the biological engineering department. And today I'm really excited to share with you uh, a project uh, that's been going on in my lab where we've been really interested in applying new algorithmic tools to a very, very long-standing problem uh, in human health. And the theme of my talk really today is the fact that small changes can have big impacts. And when we think about small changes, one of the things that really uh, draws our attention as a research group is the problem of infectious diseases. And infectious diseases are clearly caused by these very small organisms. So on the, here on the left, I'm showing you a schematic of a viral pathogen. And on the right, uh, these rod-shaped organisms are just an example of bacteria. And these, um, and these very small microscopic pathogens really uh, le give rise to some of the most uh, pressing global health problems we experience today. So infectious diseases, I think what goes without saying, infectious diseases are a huge problem. We are living through a viral pandemic. Uh, millions of people have died. And for tuberculosis, a problem near and dear to my own heart, nearly 4,000 people die a day from this disease. It is one of human health's top 10 killers of all history. And uh, just to maybe put that into context, I actually took a screenshot of the NPR coronavirus tracker. And just to maybe underscore the point, um, uh, 
viral pathogens have really uh, challenged uh, us over the last uh, many few months. And so work in my group really focuses on uh, bridging approaches in molecular immunology, bioengineering, and quantitative modeling to study host pathogen interactions. And the problem I want to talk to you about today is a problem of viral host interactions. And obviously, we are all excited and really looking forward to an effective coronavirus vaccine. We saw, we've seen over the last few weeks some really encouraging results. But um, how do vaccines actually work? And so vaccines can work through many multiple, many different arms. Uh, one arm in particular is through what we call the humoral immune system. And what the humoral immune system does is we generate antibodies. And antibodies are um, proteins that can recognize viral proteins or other what we call antigens on other pathogens. And the way that these antibodies operate is they have a recognition site that allows you to actually bind a cognate protein of interest. And what this allows, um, allows to happen is either the neutralization of the virus, meaning that you can eliminate the virus, or the recruitment of other immune cells via this part of the pr uh, protein to recruit other immune cells to help fight infection. Now, really essential in this viral protein antibody interaction is the cognate interaction between what we call the FAB and the viral protein. But as we all can, you can imagine, uh, viral proteins can change over time. They can evolve, they can mutate. And one of the things that we really like to think about when we think about antibody viral protein interaction are the range of changes that a viral protein may encounter that um, allows it to either maybe bind the antibody better or in some cases even worse. And the other thing to know about how vi as viral proteins mutate is sometimes a viral protein will mutate such that it actually makes the virus no longer infective or even viable. So I'm showing you a few schematics here. And what you can imagine here is that maybe in this setting here on the left, you have success the, where the antibody can bind the viral protein of interest. Here, the viral protein has changed a little bit, but still you can have interaction with the virus. Um, now, um, here the viral protein has changed dramatically. And actually, let's just say that this example, the, viral, the virus is non-viable. So the virus is actually no longer infectious. But now when it takes on this kind of almost rectangular shape, the virus can no longer bind to the antibody. So now this antibody is effectively uh, non ineffective at neutralizing this virus. And like many of you uh, who are thinking about visiting or com connecting with your families uh, during the holidays, uh, one of the things that I realize is that a good analogy can go a long way, especially for those of us in hybrid families where some of our family members might not be scientists. And so a really good analogy that we think about is the following. And so you can imagine when we think about viral mutations where, for example, in a single amino acid on a viral protein may change, we can think about that through the lens of language. And so you can imagine we start with a sentence, the boy pats the dog. And you, know, you can change one sentence, one letter of that sentence to now become the boy pets the dog. And really, pat, pat, pet, they're very similar. The sentence, the semantics has not changed. Let's imagine now the S changes to an X and that's actually doesn't make any sense. So this sentence is actually not viable. It's not even grammatical. It's not even a word. Now you can imagine that you change the sentence, the letter to E, the boy eats the dog. Now the semantics has changed dramatically, but still it is a grammatical sentence. And so this is a really great analogy. And we reason that what we could actually do is maybe leverage this analogy a little bit further to understand uh, the mechanics of viral evolution. And so what we drew inspiration from was a class of algorithms called natural language processing algorithms, which really provide a framework for learning the rules of a language. And what these algorithms really do is they extract patterns from large data sets. So a really pioneering graduate student in my group, Brian He, said, let's try it. Um, and so the way to think about what a natural language processing algorithm actually does 
is it really learns the probability of a word given its context. So you can take all of the news headlines or you can take all of the text from you know, the encyclopedia and begin to learn a set of sentence, a, a set of patterns. And then what the natural language processing algorithm actually does is it really tries to find the probability of a particular word filling in a sentence. And so you can imagine the Chinese president blank to Japan yesterday. And you can imagine what the model might output is that there's a 50% chance that the word that should go in that blank is went. So you can imagine that we can actually learn the big from a corpus of uh, text these particular patterns using what we call the distributional uh, hypothesis of semantics. But you know, um, there's one other thing that you can imagine doing. And so I showed you this example early on about uh, viral mutation. And you can imagine, you can learn what might be, make a grammatical sentence, but you can similarly learn like what might actually change the meaning of a sentence significantly. And so the, the modeling approach that we proposed was what we call constrained semantic change search. And I don't need, I don't want you to like focus on what the model actually allows us to, uh, the model architecture. Um, it's a state of the art uh, neural language processing architecture, similar to when you think about writing your Gmail, your email by Gmail and it predicts the next, next sentence. It's a very similar approach here. But really what we want to do are two things. We want to find both the most grammatical sentence or word that fills in the blank, but then we also want to understand, is this going to be semantically similar uh, to the original sentence or semantically different? And to show you an example of what that looks like in practice, we can start with this news headline, wine growers revel in a good season. And you can imagine we can ask the model, can you please find me the semantically closest sentence? And the semantically closest sentence that it provides is wine growers revel in strong season. So it's made a single token change or a single word change, but the meaning hasn't changed of the sentence hasn't changed. Now you can ask, let's make the most semantically different uh, change. And actually what it proposes is that wine growers revel in, a, in flu season. And so we said, okay, this is really cool. Can we actually apply this to viral sequences? So we took the amino acid sequences of the hemagglutinin protein on influenza, the flu virus. And we said, let's go ahead and train a model for the viral sequence. And what we found is uh, something really surprising. So I'll show you just one output of that model first. And so what we did is we took all of the different sequences and then we said, okay, what does the model learn for its semantics? And we can quantify semantics and organize all of those sequences. And we get this like beautiful clustering on this plot. And we said, okay, but we didn't really tell the model anything about the viruses other than the sequences. We only trained on the sequence data. But then we said, okay, is there any relationship to other biological information? And really strikingly, when we looked, all of these clusters were really enriched for specific influenza subtypes. And so this was really exciting for us. And we actually took this model and said, does it tell us any other interesting biological features? But the thing we really wanted to understand is could we now use that model to understand what semantic change for a virus would represent? And so the approach that we used is we actually used our model and we said, let's take in all um, all of the flu sequences, let's build a language model and then take another flu sequence and say, let's make every potential amino acid mutation in the computer and make a library of new viruses and then ask how the model quantifies what we call semantic change for that virus. So we can make all these mutants in silico, but really we wanna understand is, do these mutations actually change the, back, the virus's fitness? And so the, to be able to test that question, we actually Actually, we're able to utilize data from a group at the Fred Hutch Institute where they actually made every virus, made every mutant virus, and then passaged these viruses in the presence of antibodies that we that should neutralize. But now if the antibody um, uh, antigen interaction has been mutated because the viral protein has been mutated, now the, an uh, the antibody will no longer be effective and that virus will survive. And you can actually identify the surviving viruses and say, what are the mutations that actually allow the virus to survive in light of uh, these new mutations? And really strikingly, we said, okay, let's see what our model predicts. And so what we did is we said, let's go ahead and quantify all of our different amino acid mutations and say, what are the mutations that are still grammatical, but give rise to high semantic change? 
And so what I'm showing you here is an output of that model, but I really just want you to pay attention to the X and Y axis. So on the Y axis is semantic change, on the X axis is high grammaticality. And if we look for those mutations that actually give rise to high grammaticality and high semantic change, we see that they've got a lot of red X's. And what are these red X X's? These are actually experimentally identified mutations to the amino acid of HA that actually allow the virus to escape antibodies. So what our model is able to do is our model is able to predict how antibodies uh, become ineffective at neutralizing virus by just using our sequence model alone. So again, we just trained on sequence. So this was really uh, exciting for us, but then we could actually go back and ask about the structure of these proteins because the structures are known and ask, is there anything interesting that our model was able to learn? And we can look here at the structure of influenza H1. And what we see is that our model predicts that the escape enrichment, so the places where the uh, amino acid mutations allow you to escape are enriched in this region uh, called the head protein, part of the protein and depleted in the stock. And believe it or not, there's actually really great experimental evidence to suggest that antibody, if you're able to generate and like have an antibody that can react with the stock, you have really amazing antibodies for um, uh, influenza. And so I showed you this one example for influenza, but I wanna just emphasize that importantly, this model actually generalizes. So we can do it for both influenza H3, we can do this for HIV, and we can also do this for coronavirus. So really what's really exciting about this approach is that our modeling approach using natural language processing allows us to really begin to build new models to understand uh, uh, viral escape from antibodies. So to conclude, what I hope to have shown you is that semantic modeling provides a way to predict viral escape in a totally unsupervised alignment-free fashion um, that we can actually use approaches from linguistics to uh, understand viral evolution. And importantly, this might enable therapeutic design in the future. So with that, I just really want to acknowledge the superheroes behind the work. So much of this work, all of this work, 95% um, of this work was done by a superhero graduate student, Brian He, um, in collaboration with my amazing, amazing uh, collaborator in the math and computer science department, Bonnie Berger. And if you're interested in the code, it's all publicly available. And so thank you for your time. And I'm, uh, again, uh, deeply grateful for the invitation to present today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for this fantastic talk. Um, if you have questions for Brian, please submit the questions in either uh, the YouTube chat or into the Q&A that we have sent in the chat. We're going to switch now, and it is my pleasure to introduce now Onye Iwara. Dr. Iwara is an allergy and immunology physician scientist and an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Iwana received her PhD in experimental pathology from Harvard University and her medical degree from Harvard Medical School. She completed a residency in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and a clinical and research fellowship in allergy and immunology at UNC Chapel Hill. As part of the UNC Food Allergy Initiative, she studies the immunologic mechanism behind alpha-gal mammalian meat allergy. She'll be presenting today, Alpha-gal Syndrome, the Food Allergy Disruptor. Take it away, Asher. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you heard, my name is Onye Wala. I'm an assistant professor at UNC and part of the UNC Food Allergy Initiative. And it's truly a pleasure to have been invited to participate in Black in Immunology Week. Thank you so much to the organizers and thank you for a fantastic session so far. All right. So I hope that by the end of this talk, you guys will agree with me that alpha-gal syndrome is truly a food allergy disruptor. Before we jump in, I'd like to acknowledge the support that I've received from the NIH, as well as the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Foundation, and my own Thurston Arthritis Research Center. So what is alpha-gal syndrome or alpha-gal allergy? And you'll hear me use 
those two terms interchangeably throughout the talk. Well, to help you guys understand, let me tell you a story, or as my Nigerian relatives would say, story, story, story. So this is the story of a 71-year-old woman. She's an avid gardener and hiker, and she eats a burger for dinner. She wakes up in the middle of the night, six hours after dinner, with itching, hives, and difficulty breathing. She ends up fainting, and her family has to call emergency medical services. And she eventually requires treatment with epinephrine or adrenaline by injection. But the story is not over. The next day, she eats a small amount of lean ham in a sandwich and has no issues. But three weeks after that, she eats grilled pork chops with beer at a lunch barbecue and develops itchy hives and belly pain by bedtime that improve with Benadryl, which is a kind of antihistamine. So after that, she carries Benadryl and her epinephrine auto-injector on her person at all times. And she eventually cuts mammalian meat out of her diet. So this is alpha-gal syndrome. And if you were to draw the blood from this woman, you would find IgE antibodies against a sugar called galactose alpha-1,3 galactose circulating in her bloodstream. Now let's take a step back and review what Dr. Bryson had talked to, to us about earlier. What are antibodies? So these antibodies are immunoglobulins, are specialized proteins that are produced by our immune cells and that can protect us from dangerous invaders. And they come in different flavors. So that's represented here by these different ice cream cones, IgM, IgG, IgA. They can neutralize viruses, as we just heard. They can tag or coat bacteria and other microbes and mark them for destruction as well. But I'm particularly interested in IgE. And that's because IgE has the capability to neutralize toxins like venoms. But it can also help in the war against parasite infections, like hookworm infection. It can also combat parasite infestations, like scabies. And IgE antibodies play a critical role in driving allergies to things in the environment, to food, and to drugs. And we say that IgE can bind to allergens. And by allergens, I mean parts of a food, drug, or environmental substance that can cause allergic symptoms. Now, when we think about allergies, we often think about food allergies. And I think we can all agree that food allergy is a public health concern globally, but particularly in the United States, where one out of every 10 adults and one out of every 13 kids has a food allergy. And when we think about the foods that people have allergic responses to, we usually think about the top eight. So things like peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. But what I'd like you guys to do is think about these furry animals, these mammals here, as potential food allergens. And the reason is, as you can see here, one of these things is not like the other. I hope you can point out that I, as a human being, I represent primates, whereas the animals around me represent non-primate mammals. And it turns out that non-primate mammals are capable of creating or synthesizing a sugar called galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, or alpha-gal for short. Humans and other primates lack the enzyme or protein to make this sugar, and so that's why we don't have this sugar in our tissues or fats or attached to our proteins. And so as a result, when a person develops alpha-gal syndrome, it basically describes symptoms that are associated with hypersensitivity responses to this alpha-gal sugar. The alpha-gal sugar is typically attached to some kind of mammalian products like a protein or fat, and we have this IgE antibody that recognizes it and can mediate the hypersensitivity response. The other very weird thing about alpha-gal allergy is that the IgE to the alpha-gal actually rises after tick bites. And in the United States, the culprit tick is called Amblyoma americanum or the Lone Star Tick. Now, other tick species have been implicated in other countries, for example, Ixodes ricinus in Australia or Haemaphilus longicornis in Japan. But no matter the tick, bites from adult ticks and baby ticks, which are referred to as chiggers frequently in the southeastern United States, these have been linked to the development of alpha-gal syndrome. Now, as with all other food allergies, alpha-gal 
syndrome can affect kids. And so that gives me a shameless opportunity to put a picture of my kids on this presentation. But what I'd like you to get from this slide is that back in 2013, our colleagues at the University of Virginia actually described this syndrome of delayed anaphylaxis, so severe allergic reactions, angioedema, which is swelling, and urticaria, which is hives, in kids. And these kids were found to have IgE antibodies against this galactose alpha-1,3 galactose or alpha-gal. But the thing that really fascinates and perhaps freaks out a few of us in the alpha-gal syndrome world is the fact that adults can develop this food allergy even after they've safely tolerated mammalian meat for years. So if you recall, in the story that I told you, the woman who gets diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome was 71 years old. What's more, in the part of the United States where I live and work, the Southeastern United States, alpha-gal allergy is coming up as a leading cause of anaphylaxis. There was one 2018 study out of the University of Tennessee that stated that alpha-gal allergy accounted for one third of anaphylaxis cases with known cause. And what's more, if you can think to a time before COVID and before our contentious elections in the United States, alpha-gal allergy was actually in the news. There were a lot of stories in our local news media, and it even captured national atten attention. So there were profiles of alpha-gal syndrome in the New York Times and on NPR. And one of my colleagues at the UNC Food Allergy Initiative, Eddie Iglesia, actually tracked this over time. So he looked at Google searches for terms like alpha-gal allergy or meat allergy over a 15-year period spanning from 2004 to 2019. So on the y-axis here, you have relative search volume for these various terms. And across the x-axis, you have various dates across the 15 years. And if you follow the blue line and the green line, which represent search terms for alpha-gal allergy and meat allergy, you can see a steady rise in the search volume for those two topics. What's more, you can see spikes in the search volume for alpha-gal syndrome that correspond to whenever alpha-gal is profiled in the lay media. So what is it about alpha-gal syndrome and this red meat allergy that fascinates the public? Well, first of all, it's very different from conventional food allergy in that the symptoms are often squirrely. So if you remember from the story I told you at the beginning, that 71-year-old lady had a reaction with her pork barbecue and her burger, but she ate lean ham and did okay. So that demonstrates that allergic reactions may not occur with every ingestion. They're inconsistent and often delayed. And to illustrate that, take the example of this um, study subject. So this gentleman has alpha-gal syndrome and he volunteered to allow us to feed him two pork sausage patties. So six hours after waiting around to see if he would have a reaction, he just had a mild itch and single hive. You can see a little bit of redness on the back. But seven and a half hours later, you can see the redness is covering almost his entire back. And nearly eight and a half hours later is when you can see redness and hives and whelps, and it was pretty itchy. Thankfully, his symptoms improved with taking antihistamines, but he's a prime example of just how long it can take for an alpha-gal allergic person to develop symptoms after they've eaten the meat. The other point to make about red meat allergy and alpha-gal syndrome is that the magnitude and the severity of the allergic response depends on what we refer to as cofactors, things like exercise and alcohol. So somebody can eat a burger and then play basketball with their kids, and if they've got alpha-gal syndrome, they are more likely to have an allergic reaction. Or if they have wine with their steak or beer with their barbecue, and they have alpha-gal syndrome, they're more likely to have an allergic reaction. So the state of the immune system and also the dose and form of alpha-gal can also impact the magnitude and severity of the allergic response. And what we've observed is that fatty mammalian products are frequently linked to these delayed allergic reactions. So now when an allergist or immunologist is interested in studying or approaching food allergy, we typically break it down into two phases. The first phase is the sensitization phase. And during this phase, you have your first exposure to the food allergen, and that's what drives the initial production of IgE. The second phase is referred to as the effector phase. That's when the person is exposed once again to the allergen, and this is the point at which inflammatory chemicals that drive allergic symptoms in food allergy are released. 
So during the sensitization phase, you've got this food allergen, which has to cross some sort of barrier, what we call an epithelial barrier or mucosal lining, and that's typically the gut. Then it gets taken up by these specialized immune cells called antigen presenting cells. A dendritic cell is one kind, a B cell is another kind. They take up the allergen, they process it, and then they present it to another subset of immune cells called T cells. These T cells are capable of producing chemicals like IL-4. And IL-4 can influence these B cells to become IgE factories. So they make tons and tons of this allergen specific IgE that then distributes across the person's body and attaches to the person's allergy effector cells. So things like mast cells and basophils. And once this IgE is attached to the mast cells and basophils, we say that the person is sensitized to the allergen. In the effector phase, that person is then re-exposed to the allergen. So they eat the allergen, but this time the allergen binds to the IgE that's already attached to the mast cells and basophils. It brings the IgEs together in a process called cross-linking, and that activates the mast cell to produce a lot of inflammatory chemicals like histamine, which can cause a lot of the symptoms we associate with allergy, like hives or itching or flushing, belly pain and vomiting. So what do we know about the sensitization phase in alpha-gal allergy? And what do ticks really have to do with this? Well, to begin with, I um, want to let you guys know that our colleagues at UVA actually observed a significant overlap in the distribution of known alpha-gal cases in the United States and areas with high incidence of a tick-borne condition called ehrlichiosis. So you can see the concentration primarily in the southeastern United States. They saw a similar overlap with another tick-borne illness called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And so what did ehrlichiosis and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever have in common? The microbes that cause those conditions are carried and transmitted by Lone Star ticks. And if you look at a map of the geographic distribution of this Lone Star tick or Amblyoma americanum in the United States, this is a CDC map taken from in 2010, and it shows the distribution of the Lone Star tick primarily confined to the southeastern United States. But by 2019, this same map shows the distribution of this tick spreading to the Plain States and even to southern New England. And if you juxtapose this map with another map, some crowdsourced data from zmaps.com, where people who have alpha-gal allergy can put a pinpoint for themselves anywhere in the world, you can see that the geographic distribution of the Lone Star tick mirrors the geographic distribution of alpha-gal allergy cases, and it's growing. Um, what's more, if you take a person who has been bitten by larval Lone Star ticks, as we did here, and you look at their total IgE levels, as well as their alpha-gal specific IgE levels shown down here in red, you can see jumps in both of those levels shortly after they get bitten by these ticks. And on top of that, the alpha-gal sugar is actually detectable in ticks um, that are associated with alpha-gal syndrome, including this amblyoma americanum or the lone star tick, where alpha-gal was detected in the saliva and salivary glands of that tick. So as a result, we hypothesize that lone star ticks drive sensitization to alpha-gal by injecting alpha-gal into the host during the biting process, and that these tick bites actually push the immune system to mount responses that are critical for clearing parasite infection or infestations. And so we were very happy to find that when we took a mouse, which we had to genetically engineer not to express alpha-gal, because if you remember, a mouse is an example of a non-primate mammal, so when we took these alpha-gal knockout mice and injected them with lone star tick salivary gland extracts under the skin, so represented by these gray arrows, we also saw rise, rises in their alpha-gal specific IgE, shown here with this blue line. What's more, it mirrored the observations we saw with human beings who were subject to recurrent tick bites from lone star ticks. So the tick bites here are represented by the red arrows, and you can see jumps in both the total IgE and the alpha-gal specific IgE shown here in the black line. And when we looked at the expression of 770 different genes that are associated with immune responses and compared them amongst our control participants who were neither sensitized nor allergic to alpha-gal, um, our participants with alpha-gal syndrome or who had been sensitized to alpha-gal, 
What we found was that the gene expression pattern that's associated with T and B cell function, and you remember T and B cells are critical for the generation of IgE, that gene expression pattern is distinct between individuals who do not have alpha-gal syndrome shown in teal here, and individuals who are sensitized to alpha-gal and you can detect the alpha-gal IgE in the bloodstream shown in purple and yellow. And if you look at the 20 uh, most differentially expressed genes amongst these individuals, we find that subjects with detectable alpha-gal specific IgE actually have increased expression of genes that regulate immune gene expression, that facilitate antigen presentation, and that drive the type two immune responses that are implicated in allergy and defense against parasite. Um, they also have increased expression of genes associated with itch and allergic dermatitis, which are inflammatory skin rashes. So this has led us um, to view tick bites as introducing alpha-gal antigen to the immune system and then simultaneously pushing the immune system toward an immune response that is allergic or anti-parasitic in nature, a so-called type two response that promotes the generation of alpha-gal specific IgE. Now, what do we know about the effector phase in alpha-gal allergy? If you'll remember, I had mentioned at the outset that the consumption of fatty mammalian products is frequently linked to delayed allergic reactions. And so we hypothesized that the alpha-gal sugar in animal fats, so in other words, glycolipid, as well as in animal protein or glycoprotein, could attach to these alpha-gal IgEs on allergy effector cells, these mast cells and basophils, and activate them. And so in order to address this hypothesis, we actually took white blood cells from a healthy donor who did not have alpha-gal syndrome, stripped off the native IgE from these cells, and then sensitized those cells with plasma from people who did have alpha-gal syndrome. So there was alpha-gal specific IgE floating around, and then stimulated those sensitized basophils with alpha-gal in a fat form, glycolipid, or in a protein form, glycoprotein. We then harvested the cells and then stained them specifically for basophils and for the expression of an activation marker. And we looked for this using flow cytometry. And so what we were able to show was that if you take these basophils and you sensitize them with the IgE from a person that has alpha-gal syndrome, and then you stimulate them either with an alpha-gal glycolipid or an alpha-gal glycoprotein, you can see an increase in the frequency of these allergy effector cells, these basophils, that express their marker of activation, or CD63. If you also add a compound called omalizumab, which is actually an antibody that prevents IgE from attaching to basophils and mast cells, the more of this omalizumab you add to the culture, the less activation of these basophils that you see. And so that suggested to us that our alpha-gal glycolipids could activate our sensitized basophils in a manner that depended on IgE. And this was actually one of the first reports of mammalian fats activating allergy effector cells in the context of food allergy. And so now when we address this question of, you know, why is there a delay in the appearance of symptoms in alpha-gal syndrome, we think that it's not because the basophils or mast cells can't respond to alpha-gal in a lipid form. We think that it's due to, uh, maybe it's reflecting the hours that are required for the absorption of these fats, for the breakdown and metabolism, and then packaging of these fats before they actually get delivered to the mast cells and the basophils. So with that, I hope you guys agree with me that alpha-gal allergy really changes our current paradigm for food allergy. The effector phase, you know, the symptom onset is so delayed, it can be hours. The IgE is forming against a sugar instead of a protein. And for people to become sensitized to alpha-gal, they need to have been bitten by a tick. And so I hope you guys will take away that alpha-gal syndrome is an allergic condition with a global reach. And the case numbers and geographic reach of the ticks that cause alpha-gal sensitization are growing. So we need to improve our understanding of the immunology and the pathobiology behind the syndrome, because I would argue that understanding alpha-gal syndrome will truly broaden our understanding of food allergy. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all our collaborators at UNC in the Cummings Lab, the UNC Food Allergy Initiative, and of course, our UNC alpha-gal study subjects. 
And I just like to end with this picture of my lab. This is how we've been doing lab meetings, of course, for the last few months. And I'm really grateful to be able to work with such a fantastic th team. And I'll be happy to take your questions during the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lenye, for this amazing presentation on alpha call syndrome. It is another example of how human-driven modifications of our environment triggers the development of emerging diseases. If you have questions for Onye, um, I encourage you to uh, submit questions uh, for later on the Q&A discussion. I will now, now welcome Dr. Tonya Webb. Dr. Webb is an associate professor at the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She completed a doctoral degree in microbiology and immunology at Indiana University with studies focused on investigating the role of CD1D1 molecules and invariant natural killer T cells in antiviral immunity. Her postgraduate work includes postdoctoral fellowships at Indiana University School of Medicine and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. At UMSOM, Dr. Webb has leadership role in microbiology and knowledge department at the Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Center for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. She founded the biotech company WebCures in 2016 and advocates to increase diversity and equity in academic medicine and healthcare. Today, she will be presenting profiling NKT cells responses in cancer patients to identify novel immune biomarkers. Thank you for joining us today, Tonya. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to have the chance to share with you some of our work. And again, my name is Tonya Webb. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And I'll talk to you about some of the work that we're doing to understand natural killer T cell biology and their role in cancer. So first off to disclose, as was mentioned, that um, I founded a small biotech, Web Cures, and I also work with screen therapeutics and immune 3D. So first I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab who've done the work. Um, so these are some pictures of uh, my lab over the last few years, and I would like to highlight, again, as you know, that successful people never reach their goals alone. So I would not have been able to accomplish this work without the outstanding um, support and work ethic by my team. So what's near and dear to my heart? Cancer immunotherapy. So I quickly want to highlight um, the role of cancer immunotherapy in current cancer treatment. And so as I show you these titles here or these covers um, from Science and Nature, cancer immunotherapy has been heralded as the breakthrough of the year several times. So this first issue was from the December 2013 issue of Science, but the 2018 uh, December issue also looked at further developments in cancer immunotherapy. And then the one at the bottom is talking about uh, cancer immunotherapy as being the greatest thing since sliced bread. So I just included it because someone else said it. But if we look at this cover of time, it says, what if your immune system could be taught to kill cancer? And so if we look at that a little bit more closely, it says inside the brutally selective, and that's because cancer immunotherapy works in 20 to 40% of patients, hugely expensive. And that's because it can cost Thirty to $50,000 per cycle per treatment, and you can need three to five cycles. So it can be extremely expensive, but what we want to focus on are the life-saving trials of immunotherapy. And so in sticking with that, while immunotherapy has been one of the greatest breakthroughs of our time, the questions that we really want to address and focus on is how do we develop better treatments, right, that are cost-effective and more effective and then how do we select which patients are the best candidates for this therapy? And so the work that I'll quickly share with you today is trying to address those two questions. So how did I get on this path? So in my graduate studies, I worked on um, natural killer T cells or NKT cells in uh, 
antiviral immune responses. And then later I transitioned into cancer. So I really wanted to bring NKT cells back into the work that I was doing focused on cancer immunotherapy. And then um, what is your motivation? So I always like to talk to the people in my lab and encourage them to focus on the work that really drives them. And so the work that drives me is to increase the number of hugs as shown below. <clears throat> So again, why do we focus on NKT cells? And that's because we believe they play an important role in anti-tumor immune responses. Because if you look in the center, we have NKT cells and they can directly kill cancer cells or tumor cells that's shown below. But not only do they directly kill cancer cells, they can also modulate the effector functions of other immune cells. So they can enhance uh, the maturation of dendritic cells, they produce cytokines or proteins that can modulate or activate a cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CD8 T cells, as well as natural killer cells. So NKT cells can enhance both the innate and adaptive or early and later stages of the immune system. And so that's why we believe they play a really uh, key role in anti-tumor immune responses. So again, they can directly mediate their effector functions and they can also serve as activators of other immune cells. So if we take a step closer and look more closely at NKT cells, while they can play this critical role, they are often reducing cancer patients. So when I first started my lab, I wanted to see in my hands in my lab if we observed the same phenomena, meaning that there was a reduction in NKT cells in cancer patients. So we looked in healthy volunteers and compared them to newly diagnosed cancer patients. So we looked in lymphoma patients, breast cancer patients, and prostate cancer patients. And what I think you can appreciate is that across the board, NKT cells circulating in the blood, as indicated on the y-axis, are reduced compared to healthy donors and different cancer types. And so work by our lab and others have shown that NKT cell number and function can be reduced in cancer patients and this can be independent of tumor type or mode. And studies from other groups have uh, worked to modulate NKT cells in clinical trials, but it only worked in patients that had functional NKT cells. And that makes sense, right? If you don't have NKT cells, how can they serve to help when you activate them in cancer patients, right? So our overarching hypothesis is that NKT cells play a critical role in anti-tumor immune responses, Thus, their, their restoration will enhance current immunotherapeutic strategies. So that's what we're focused on. We want to understand why NKT cells are reduced and then develop platforms that can work to restore their number and function. So first we did some proof of principle experiments and we generated a bead that could serve to activate NKT cells. So we have a magnetic bead here and we put on proteins um, anti-CD28 and antibody, and then a fusion protein that has an antibody base that would also activate NKT cells. So this provides two signals that would be needed, again, to activate NKT cells. And we call these artificial antigen presenting cells. So similar to the work that was talked about by Dr. Uh, Wella and um, Dr. Bryson, where they talked about antibodies and activating the immune system. That's what we want to do here. But in this case, we're using these uh, proteins and our magnetic beads as a scaffold or something to hold these proteins so that we can activate NKT cells. And we're using this artificial platform instead of antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells because dendritic cells uh, can function, their function can vary depending on the cancer patient's pre-treatment status, um, their cells may not function normally. And so using this artificial platform will allow us to have a standardized approach that we can use across the board. And so first I want to show you um, if it works or not, right? So this was some work done by a former graduate student in the lab where um, if you look at the initial population, and if you focus on the upper right-hand quadrant, you see zeros there, right? So this is our negative control and our positive control. And when we initially look for NKT cells, you can see that they may not be present in the blood, right? So if we develop the therapy targeting NKT cells, 
it, it may not be effective because there aren't any detectable NKT cells present. However, after two weeks of stimulating with our bead, you see a slight increase in their percentage. And then within four to five weeks, we'll have between 70 and 90% NKT cells. So we're able to use our platform to rapidly expand NKT cells. And we've done this with a series of healthy donors as well as cancer patients. But we started working with a certain population of lymphoma patients, mantle cell lymphoma patients, and we were not able to expand their cells. So if you look in A at our healthy donor, the number at the top is the percentage of NKT cells and the number at the bottom is the absolute number of cells. And what I really want you to focus on is this upper right quadrant in looking at mantle cell lymphoma patients. And again, after our weeks of expansion, there were no NKT cells. So while it, we found that our therapy would work for melanoma patients, ovarian cancer patients, breast cancer patients, um, we could not expand NKT cells it, from mantle cell lymphoma patients. Not only could we not expand them, when we looked at the um, CD3 positive population and stimulated them, with either um, anti-CD3, CD28, which is a T-cell activator, or a general activator using PMA and ionomycin, these cells would not become activated. And so a postdoc in the lab thought, why don't we move over to stem cells, right? We can't stimulate your cells from the blood, so why don't we try stem cells? So we isolated hematopoietic stem progenitor cells from the bone marrow of healthy donors as well as lymphoma patients. We put them on stromal cultures and then added in our bead. And if you look at the initial population, you can see that we really started out with hematopoietic stem cells. After three weeks, we had T cells. And after five weeks, we had NKT cells. So this was really exciting, right? So if we cannot activate and expand your cells from blood, we can use stem cells in order to generate a population of NKT cells. And so then we moved on. So this was great. We were able to do this in a dish. We can expand your cells in order to give them back. But so then we started thinking, what if you do have a population of functional NKT cells? Can we make a smaller bead, a nanoparticle that could activate your immune system? So in A, I'm just showing you the controls. And comparing to our um, larger bead, if we use nanoparticles, uh, such as Q dots, we can titrate up and get an increasing um, level of activation of NKT cells. And we used a common melanoma model, um, B16 F10 melanomas. And if we look at our non-functionalized particles and compare those to our functionalized particles, you see a significant reduction in tumor metastasis. So now we can make a smaller formulation that we can either inject intravenously or intranasally and get a reduction in tumor metastasis. Not only that, Q dots fluoresce. So we could actually use these new particles as a way of tracking your cells uh, in the tissue. So now we can activate the cells as well as look at their distribution within the tissue, which is really, really exciting. And then lastly, we wondered, can we use this as a diagnostic? So we can use it in vitro to expand cells. We can use it in vivo to activate them. But again, our question was, who would best benefit from this therapy? Because if you don't have NKT cells, this therapy would not work. So I had a student um, who came in to get, gain additional research experience. And she developed a method um, to rapidly assess NKT cell function using our B platform. So we took the beads, collected blood, and then stimulated the cells for a short time period, and then performed qPCR uh, or quantitative uh, PCR to look at activation of these cells. And then an, a postdoc in the lab took it a step further and validated this method, looking at healthy donors, breast cancer patients, and lymphoma patients. And we found that we could use our bead-based system to assess NKT cell function as well as total T cell function. And if you look here, um, strikingly, we found that NKT cells were functional in our breast cancer patient cohort. So similar to some of the profiling data that was shown in our last um, outstanding talk, 
on food allergies or meat allergies, uh, we found that we could do proteomics and uh, transcriptomic analysis using nanostring technology to look and identify markers that correlated with NKT cell uh, activation in breast cancer patients. And then we had another student in the lab who looked at our lymphoma patients. And so these papers are currently being um, submitted for publication. So stay tuned and you can get an update on the biomarkers that we found. Um, so in summary, we've developed a novel platform using our NKT cell uh, based approach to modulate their effector functions for cancer immunotherapy. So we've used these beads as a standardized reproducible system that can be used to expand and activate NKT cells. And if you do not have functional NKT cells in your blood, we can actually isolate stem cells and use those to generate NKT cells. Not only that, we've developed an in vivo method where we can use a nanoparticle-based formulation uh, to activate your NKT cells in vivo. And we've also developed a diagnostic tool to assess baseline NKT cell function in patients. So where are we going with this? So our recent graduate student developed a proliferation assay. So now we have a platform to modulate and activate NKT cells. And now we want to really understand what factors are important for their development, their development, excuse me, in function in order to improve their implementation in cancer immunotherapy. And so this work was recently published. And so lastly, I would like to acknowledge again my current lab members as well as my previous lab members, my outstanding collaborators, both uh, locally and abroad, as well as the grant support that has helped us to be able to do this work. And I would be happy to take any questions that you may have during the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tonya, for this amazing presentation on harnessing NKT cells in cancer and no therapy. We again, we again encourage our audience to submit questions later for um, the Q&A. It is now my pleasure to introduce our last speaker for uh, the science talk session, Dr. Asher Williams. Dr. Williams is a Trinidad and Tobago national scholar who earned her, bach her bachelor's of science in clinical and biomolecular engineering at New York University. She worked as a bioengineering intern at NASA before pursuing a PhD in clinical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Her graduate work focused on harnessing bacterial production systems to generate pain-relieving compounds and anticoagulant drugs through metabolic engineering. She was awarded the RPI Presidential Graduate Research Fellowship and published over 10 co-authored papers in peer-reviewed journals during her PhD. Dr. Williams uh, also served as Vice President of the Black Graduate Student Association at RPI and worked on several initiatives and efforts to increase the recruitment and retention of minoritized students in graduate education. She is currently a Presidential Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Cornell University, where her research aim at developing a platform for cell-free biosynthesis of conjugate vaccines against enteric infections. Today, she will be presenting cell-free biosynthesis of conjugate vaccine. Thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. You're muted. Can you, yeah, can you try to unplug your headset? Maybe that's, that's where the problem is coming from. Can you try to unmute now? That's better. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Joel. Um, so I'm a chemical engineer by training. So I'm really excited to be invited to be a part of Black in uh, Immuno Week. And today I'll be talking about some of the conjugate vaccine. Um, 
I think we lost the sound. I can hear you, but actually very faint, I think. Yeah, it says my audio is connected. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, we can hear you. Maybe, um, yeah. Okay. That sounds, is that's it, okay. Is that okay now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So as I was saying, um, I've been working on cell-free biosynthesis of conjugate vaccines, in particular against uh, bacterial enteric infections, which cause uh, diarrhea and dysentery. So acute diarrheal diseases rank second amongst all infectious diseases as a killer of children below the age of five years worldwide. In addition to causing more than 15% of the approximately 500,000 deaths due to diarrhea each year, repeated infections with the pathogens known as enterotoxigenic E. coli or ETEC and Shigella can have long-term consequences on uh, a child's growth and development. And this can lead to reduced long-term learning and earning potential and also contribute to uh, poverty and susceptibility to infectious diseases as well as other long-term health consequences. So uh, there's a pressing need for um, novel preventative strategies. In 2015, there were approximately 2.4 billion cases of these infections globally, with an average of two to three episodes per child each year. Uh, between the years of 2000 and 2015, the number of childhood deaths actually decreased from 1.2 million to 500,000. But although fewer children are dying from diarrheal infections, many of the survivors suffer uh, the long-term consequences that I discussed on the previous slide. So there is still that need for preventative interventive strategies to tackle this critical burden on child health and human potential, particularly in a way that is widely accessible, cost-effective, and importantly, easily administrable in these low and middle-income countries. So as a potential solution, we have been exploring uh, self-reproduction of conjugate vaccines. And these vaccines have been proven to widely protect against bacterial infections. Um, so they represent a powerful approach for expanding vaccine availability and also tackling um, unmet medical needs, particularly in the developing world. So our initial targets are the ETEC and Shigella pathogens. And our research work seeks to address this challenge through the development of a system for cell-free biomanufacturing of safe and effective conjugate vaccines at the point of care. Uh, the system we're developing will also ensure that these vaccines will be realistically accessible to the target population as the production system is designed to evade the economic and logistical barriers that are typically associated with uh, conventional vaccines. So of the many possible candidate antigens for a subunit vaccine development, carbohydrates are particularly appealing because of their ubiquitous presence in various forms on the surface of various pathogens like bacteria, viruses. Um, and as shown in this figure, they can also be attached to various molecules through the process of glycosylation. So they can be connected to proteins to form glycoproteins or lipids, forming glycolipids. And they can also exist as free structures. In the, uh, the pathogenic Shigella and ETEC strains of interest, the O antigens are actually exposed on the surface of the cell where they are highly immunogenic. So in bacterial polysaccharides, the O antigen is typically a, a repetitive glycan polymer that's contained within the lipopolysaccharide, which is just part of the outer membrane of the bacteria. To provide some context for conjugate vaccines, uh, when cell-free uh, or when free capsular polysaccharides and lipopolysaccharide antigens are administered as vaccines, they typically stimulate T-cell independent immune responses, 
which are characterized by short duration antibody responses. And there's no sustained T cell memory to defend against future infections. So um, these free polysaccharides generate immunoglobulin M or IgM antibodies, which are generally produced as the body's first response to a new infection or exposure to an antigen. And normally the amount of IgM will decrease over time as IgG, another antibody is produced. Um, and the body will retain a catalog of these IgG antibodies that can be rapidly reproduced when exposed again to that same antigen. But this uh, IgM to IgG class switching is not induced with just the free polysaccharide. However, these polysaccharide antigens can be uh, converted to more potent immunogens by conjugation or attachment to an immunogenic protein carrier, which will then lead to development of memory B cells and long-lived T cell memory. Uh, so essentially these conjugate vaccines have been developed to induce a robust immune response against bacterial capsular polysaccharides and provide that long lasting immunity. So although conjugate vaccines are a highly effective and safe strategy for protecting against um, diverse pathogens, conventional methods for their production have several limitations. Uh, most notably, the traditional method of chemical conjugation illustrated here is a complex multi-step process that involves isolation, uh, chemical activation, um, and also uh, chemical conjugation of the bacterial polysaccharide to a separately produced and purified carrier protein. So in addition to being a time-consuming and expensive process, it is also low yielding due to considerable losses occurring at each step, uh, and the product is often heterologous. So with the genesis of bacterial glycoengineering, the multi-step chemical conjugation procedure that I previously described has been widely replaced by a single fermentation where engineered E. coli cells will transfer the capsular polysaccharide or O antigen to a specific acceptor sequin on a carrier protein. And then the conjugation is catalyzed by an enzyme called PGLB. Um, however, this protein glycan coupling technology also has with it limitations because it relies on living cells. So it needs you know, highly centralized manufacturing. It requires specialized equipment as well as cold chain distribution. And these factors, of course, present economic and logistical barriers that limit the reach of vaccination campaigns and they can also slow the response to any pathogen outbreaks. So to circumvent some of these challenges, we have been exploring producing glycoproteins using uh, cell-free protein synthesis or a CFPS. And the CFPS system harnesses a set of catalytic components that are needed to generate energy and synthesize proteins from crude cell lysates. So the activated catalysts, which are in the cell lysate, essentially act as a chemical factory to synthesize and fold your desired protein products when they're incubated with essential substrates like the DNA or mRNA template that encode your target protein, along with other supplements like cofactors, amino acids, and salts. Um, and the cell-free system is beneficial uh, it has several associated advantages, including its open nature. So it essentially allows the user to directly influence the system of interest. So new components can be added or synthesized and then maintained at precise concentrations. It also uh, offers reduced cell viability constraints, which means that now you can uh, freely produce complex proteins at titers that would otherwise be toxic in living cells. Um, additionally, processes that typically take days or weeks to design and execute in vivo or in living cells can be done more rapidly in a cell-free system. And another important point for our purposes is that 
CFPS reactions can be freeze dried for storage at ambient temperature for up to one year. So this cell free technology was adapted to provide a, a rapid way of developing and distributing vaccines against bacterial pathogens. Essentially, the system involves expression of pathogen specific polysaccharides. So capsule polysaccharides or O antigens that are specific to uh, the ETEC and Shigella pathogens, uh, along with the PGLB enzyme or another bacterial oligosaccharotransferase. And these are expressed in engineered non-pathogenic E. coli with detoxified lysates that contain essentially all of the machinery required to synthesize the bioconjugate vaccines. And these reactions can be used to produce bioconjugates containing the licensed carrier proteins, then freeze dried without losing activity for uh, refrigeration, free transportation and storage, which is important in these resource limited regions then the freeze-dried reactions can be activated at the point of care. Um, so to demonstrate, um, oh, yeah. So to demonstrate the proof of concept for um, cell-free bioconjugate production, members of the, the Lisa lab as well as the Jewett lab that we're collaborating with expressed a set of eight different carrier proteins that are currently being used in FDA approved conjugate vaccines. And these were expressed in vitro or outside of the cell in soluble conformations where we, they're able to bypass many of the common challenges that are associated with expressing you know, these proteins as full length products in living E. coli cells. So all eight of the carriers were synthesized in vitro with soluble yields uh, as shown here, ranging from about 50 to 650 micrograms per mil. And these CFPS approaches have been shown um, to have great promise for expressing these difficult to express proteins because of that open nature of the reaction, which allows you to easily manipulate and improve production of more complex protein targets. So using our uh, cell-free glycoprotein synthesis system, the carrier proteins PD and uh, superfolder green fluorescent protein or SSGFP were successfully conjugated to a particular O antigen that was derived from uh, the pathogen Francisella tularensis or FT as it's shown here. And the results of fluorescent Western blotting are shown where the antigen antibody complex is used to detect specific proteins that are immobilized on a, a blotting membrane after separation. So by blotting with an anti-HIST antibody, uh, which is in red and a commercial antibody specific to the, the O antigen polysaccharide in green, uh, a ladder-like banding pattern is shown, which is characteristic of that O antigen attachment. And this pattern only appears when all of the necessary CFPS reaction components are included. Uh, furthermore, when a, a freeze dried reaction was assembled using the detoxify lysates uh, to synthesize anti FD bioconjugates for immunization studies, the ELISA endpoint serum revealed that the cell-free bioconjugates boosted production of the, the FD O polysaccharide specific antibodies as when compared to um, bioconjugates produced in living cells as well as a, a PBS control. So we found that our cell-free system um, after doing um, different tests, that we found that it is beneficial in many different ways. It's, fast with the ability to produce multiple individual doses in uh, about an hour. It's a robust system, so it yields equivalent amounts of the bioconjugates over a range of operating temperatures. It's modular, which means we can interchange the carrier proteins or the, um, the polysaccharide antigens to target different diseases. 
It's a shelf-stable product and it's also safe being produced in a endotoxin-free uh, strain that was genetically engineered. So with these results demonstrating the generality and modularity of this cell-free glycoprotein synthesis approach for producing bioconjugates, we are currently producing bioconjugates bearing the, the O polysaccharide antigens from two ETEC and Shigella strains, which are the leading causes of travelers' diarrhea and also major causes of diarrheal diseases in lower income countries, especially among children. And these bioconjugates are being produced in living cells as well as in a cell free format. And ultimately, we will use them for mouse immunizations to test for uh, pathogen specific antibody result, uh, responses. So overall, the platform offers a new way to deliver the protective benefits of an important class of antibacterial vaccines to both the developed and developing world. And with that, I would like to thank the members of the DeLisa Lab who have been very welcoming since I started my postdoc at Cornell earlier this year, um, especially Ty, Tommy, and Aravin, who did most of the work that I discussed, along with the members of the Jewett Lab that we collaborated with, Jessica and Katie. I'd like to thank my funding sources, the NIH, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Cornell Presidential Postdoc Program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asher, for this fantastic presentation on cell-free bioconjugate production. Um, we're going to start the Q&A, and there is still time to ask questions for Asher. So we have had a lot of questions coming in the chat. Uh, we're going to try to go through some of them, uh, hopefully most of them. Uh, we have a question here for Dr. Bryson from Medina. Could you speak more on how this work uh, could help with understanding emerging viruses? Is it easier to use these algorithms for certain types of viruses? So that's a really great question. Um, so, you know, one of the things that our algorithm really requires um, is sequencing information. So if you imagine that you're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, our models have been consistently updated significantly because of new SARS-CoV-2 spike protein sequences becoming available. So we think that um, where our model fits in is one, for like HA, we can do a lot because there's a lot of historical information. But we think that what we would hope is that during an emergent virus, uh, that we can like deploy our algorithm immediately, start receiving all of the sequencing data that's coming in and build the model in real time with the data that's becoming available. So that's our worldview because maybe that will also help us kind of identify what that language is for whatever the next pandemic uh, um, is. And then we can actually maybe think about utilizing that to guide immunogen design. So we think that it's gonna be a partner tool kind of in real time um, as viral sequences are becoming available. Another related question is, um, could you speak on if and how your technology can be used to predict if the potential virus can potentially jump from animal into human? So that's a really interesting question. And um, if you actually look in our preprint um, that's on BioArchive, one of the observations that we made is that for some, like if you actually look at some of the clustering um, if for the host subtype, what you could actually see is kind of this relationship between the avian influenza and human influenza and like historical data to support the like avian to human transmission of the virus. So actually some of the clustering actually can recover that tropism uh, switch, so to speak. And so that is that's something that the model uncovers, whether it could predict it is an open question because I think we'd need more training data specifically to be able to say, we want to predict um, you know, host um, changes in host preference. That's interesting. And another question is, are there any possibilities for using the viral protein language model to predict um, the success rate of a vaccine? 
Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. So one of the things that our model would predict is that there are going to be perhaps regions that where escape potential is enriched in those in which it's depleted. So if it were possible, let's say, to uh, focus our efforts in immunogen design to the regions that perhaps our model is going to predict as low likelihood of escape, maybe because it leads to structural collapse of the proteins such that you know their infectivity is lost or viability of the virus is lost. Um, that's what we think could be useful is that it could provide an supplemental information to like what the structural biologists do, which is like really great, which is essential information. We think that these approaches could also help supplement and put some you know, as opposed to thinking just exclusively about amino acids in the protein, um, really put some kind of ranked ordering of which amino acids may be the most, I guess, stable from a language perspective. Thank you so much for these answers. Um, we have questions here for Onye from Zuri Sullivan. Did you observe other antibody isotypes to alpha-gal following sensitization with alpha-gal plus deep salivary extracts? Great, that's a fantastic question. So actually, um, humans make antibodies against alpha-gal that are non-IgE isotypes. So they make IgM and IgG and IgA. And the thought is, you know, if you remember back to Dr. Williams talk, there are a lot of organisms that live in our gut and they have carbohydrates on their surface. And so the thought is that we produce some of these anti-gal antibodies because it's in response to some of the microbes living in the gut. Um, and so with our tick salivary gland extract, we do see some IgG um, isotypes. So IgG1 is like the cognate isotype in mice that comes before IgE usually, um, but we also see the IgE as well. Great. Another question here from Paula Cavadas. Can ticks that cause Lyme disease also sensitize? Ah, oh, that's a great question too. So the tick um, that's responsible for, or that transmits Lyme disease is the deer tick, um, Ixodes scapularis. And so to date, there's no, there have been no reports that people who get bites from deer ticks or from Ixodes scapularis are sensitized to alpha However, um, my colleagues, Scott Cumming and Shailesh Chowdhury at UNC actually got tick salivary gland extract from our collaborator, Shahid Karim, um, from Ixodes scapularis, and they could detect alpha-gal sugar in the tick sal salivary gland extract of that tick. And when they took basophils in that indirect basophil assay that I had talked to you guys about before and stimulated them with the, the Ixodes scapularis tick salivary gland extract, they could activate the basophils. So it seems to suggest that maybe there's alpha-gal in there. So I'm not entirely sure why it is that we haven't had reports of this Ixodes scapularis um, triggering sensitization to alpha-gal. So it's a fantastic question. Great. And from Victor, Victor Bula, could you comment on the finding that helmet infections have been shown to reduce the prevalence of allergies and how this differs in the case of tick bites and alpha-gal syndrome? Also a great question. I'd like to explore that further with mass models in the lab. But yes, so um, when we think about helmet infection, we're often thinking about uh, GI hump infections or worm infections. And it turns out that even though worm infections induce really dramatic um, type two IgE dominated immune responses, they also happen to stimulate pretty robust regulatory uh, immune responses as well. So regulatory T cells, I think they're also regulatory macrophages. And it turns out that this regulatory response, which is often dominated by production of regulatory cytokines like IL-10, will suppress the generation of allergic immune responses. And so there are lots, um, there's descriptions um, of individuals in say developing countries where worm infections are endemic, where you see a lower frequency of people with food allergy. And there are lots of mouse models. In fact, my mentor, Catherine Nagler at University of Chicago had a mouse model of peanut allergy. And if you pre-infected these mice with helminth infection, then you could actually reduce the peanut allergic response in these mice. 
Now, in the case of alpha-gal syndrome, instead of having an internal or endogenous parasite like you have with worm infection, you now have an external or ectoparasite. And so I'm, you know, I'm not sure whether it's the location of where the parasite is attaching. Maybe that's um, driving the development of other immune system cells and maybe not upregulating regulatory cells to the same extent as what you see with endogenous helminth infection. But I would love to do like a co-infection model where we've got helminth infected by it so that we put the parasites on top of them and see whether or not we have increases or blunted sensitization to alpha-gal. So fantastic question. I have to do the experiment and keep you posted. Fantastic. And uh, another question is, what changes occur in immune, infect, uh, in immune function following Lone Star type tick bite? What is pushing this response to enhance sensitization? And is it TH2 driven? Yes, so it, it appears that when um, ticks bite or Lone Star ticks bite, they, um, so I am not as familiar with all of the mechanics of what goes on at the tick bite itself, tick bite itself at the skin, but it does attract basophils to the site of the tick bite. And there is some sort of interaction. The thought is that the trauma of the tick bite is inducing some sort of epithelial barrier defense response at the skin. And so you have the production possibly of um, um, not exactly TH2 cytokines, but type 2 skewing cytokines that can be produced by epithelial cells, so like IL-33, IL-25, TSLP, um, and that this kind of cytokine milieu is what then pushes the, um, the, in, the T cells that hang out basically in the skin um, towards a more TH2 type response. Um, so yeah, there's definitely evidence that basophils are attracted to sites of tick bites. I don't know yet if we have any evidence showing the production of these IL-33, TSLP, IL-25 barrier cytokines, but that's the leading thought as to why it gets pushed to a, a type 2. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Webb from Medina. Is there any chance of the beads activating other cells? Oh, so that's a really nice question. So we tailor the beads so that, it, that they are specific for NK T cells, um, but we can make other beads that can activate other immune type cells. So the ones that we're using specifically only activate NK T cells. I guess I'm gonna follow up on that. What about macrophages and dendritic cells that can you know, pick up these, these beads and maybe non-specifically have uh, some sort of reactions? So actually, that is a really great point. So the beads have an antigen on them to activate NKT cells, but if you pulse cells um, from the blood, so peripheral blood mononuclear cells with that have NKT cells in there. So if you use this, you can see the beads within the antigen presenting cells. So macrophages do eat the beads and it looks really interesting. Um, and then they can present that antigen to NKT cells. So again, the overall effect is that NKT cells become activated, but there was a really nice study uh, published a while back, like a 99 uh, cutting edge AI paper that showed once NKT cells are activated in vivo, then you get subsequent activation of natural killer cells, um, dendritic cells will upregulate crystallinatory molecules, you'll get activation of classic T cell subsets. So we do think that NKT cells are the drivers and can modulate both um, the innate and adaptive arms because they make both TH1, TH2, and TH17 type cytokines. So thanks so much. And another question from Calif Wilson. Does your system function most effectively against liquid or solid tumors? So that's a great question. And if you look at the data that we showed, we weren't sure if we should focus on uh, blood cancers or hematological malignancies or solid. So we picked lymphoma and breast, sorry. Uh, we picked both uh, lymphoma and breast cancer in order to see which type of cancer we should focus on. And what I didn't really go into, because again, we're working on this, uh, is that we found that in breast cancer patients, particularly triple negative breast cancer patients, which do not have a lot of options, NKT cells were activated. However, um, so suggesting that we could move forward 
with our NKT cell based therapy in that realm. However, in lymphoma patients, we found a significant reduction in NKT cell function. And it seems to correlate with a relapse, which is very, very striking. And so that would suggest that other therapeutic options would be necessary, or we should work to restore NKT cell function in this population. So we haven't um, really determined which ones would be best because we can still use the bees to assess NKT cell function independent of tumor type, but it does tell us what type of therapeutic option we should tailor um, our, our treatment towards. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have your questions for Asher Williams from Denise McAfee of Bay. Do you think conjugating a virus with recombinant antibody against cancer is, would be a successful feat or there would be a neutralization? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. Maybe a, a bit outside of the scope of what I've done, but um, I know Probably the- trying to reach some COVID, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I figure I figure there's there's a um, yeah. trying to make a connection there. Um, I mean, I know antibodies can decrease uh, the replication of viruses by blocking attachment to the host cell. Um, so I guess there could be some mechanism there to prevent penetration of the the host cell membrane or interfere with um, the uncoating of the virus within the cell. But in terms of conjugating, um, I'm not really sure, honestly, um, if there would be a neutralization reaction, just even with attempting conjugation. Um, but it would be something to look into for sure. All right. Thank you very much for responding to all these questions. We're gonna to move to the, the more panel discussion section of our um, session. And I'll start by basically putting science aside for a moment and, and share about you know, the activities that you do when you're not doing all these amazing things that you just told us about. So well, what, what are your things? Uh, tell me, uh, let's start with, uh, with Kunya. Oh yeah, so um, I really love science, but outside of science, I spend a lot of time with my family. We enjoy watching movies. I really love to dance and read books and um, take walks, especially now during this time during the pandemic, we've been able to get out and just walk around and uh, enjoy nature. That's fantastic. What about you, Anya? What's your thing? I, I heard that you're a singer. <laughs> I'm not singing, guys. But yeah, I do enjoy singing. I do enjoy singing with my church choir. Um, and I feel like as Dr. Webb was speaking, I'm like, yeah, I like that too. I like enjoying time with my family, watching movies. I like actually doing high intensity interval training. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but I had a picture of Shanti. He's like a celebrity trainer that has really popularized that. So I love doing workouts with him. Um, and then running, um, dancing, just generally hanging out, reading as well. Yeah, it seems like all of this contribute to, you know, staying sane and, and um, yeah. What about you, Brian? What do you do? Um, I, uh, so I, I guess I have like two main hobbies. One of them is making ice cream. So um, when we were kids, Ooh. The only way that we could actually have ice cream as kids is if we like turned the crank on the ice cream maker ourselves. I'm dating myself. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's a hobby that has stayed with me. And then to balance out the ice cream making, I do a lot of running as well. Nice. And uh, Asher, would you share with your about your oldies? Um, so I've been doing a lot of cooking since you can't really buy out and then we're at home. Um, and also working out. I'm typically a gym rat, but now that we have to wear masks to the gym, I've hopped on the home workout train. Um, so yeah, those are kind of my two things. Great. Yeah, it's good to hear uh, this. I, I think there is this narrative that 
um, fantastic scientists and successful scientists like all of you, you know, are only in the lab and only focusing on the lab and, you know, do not do anything outside of the lab. And I, I think, you know, we need to definitely communicate on that. No, that, that's not, that's not it. They're actually doing things outside of the lab contribute to being successful in science because it helps to balance and, and to keep, to keep profiting, to go back to the lab and, and, and do more interesting science. Um, thank you for sharing these. Um, let's move to another question where um, I would like you to share about um, navigating um, the institutions that you've been part of. Um, you've been all part of very, you know, prestigious research institutions in the U.S. And uh, can you share about tips that help to navigate and, and that help to, you know, what, what was the, the thing that helped you to put your foot in the door? So um, for me, I think a lot of the spaces that I've been in, I've been one of a few Black people or the only Black person, but I found it very helpful, especially during graduate school, to sort of find community, even people outside of my department, just other people on campus who have a similar cultural background. Um, or if you can't find it at your institute, connecting virtually with, with other institutions, like that has been really helpful to me in terms of just providing a support system outside of your family, you know, people who are actually going through the same type of process that you're uh, enduring and they can provide feedback and support. So that has been helpful for me. And it's something I'm, as a postdoc, I'm still trying to develop that community, but yeah. Ryan, do you have tips for having your foot in the door at MIT? I, I think you started you started there and continued some of your um, um, journey in, in science at MIT. Do you have tips for you know the youngers that are thinking of you know becoming engineers and bioengineers? engineers? Yeah, so you know. Um... A few things, you know, I think it's important. I think as I think about getting the door, getting a foot in the door at MIT, it helps to understand kind of the intellectual ethos of the place and understand like how you can bring something, you know, like I, you know, I was told to never like life advice I got from my mother is you never show up to a party open, hand, like empty handed. And like even showing up to academia, you want to know, you want to be able to communicate what you bring to the party. And, you know, so what we, you know, what I, what I love about my colleagues and, you know, my, everybody might have something different to answer is that they bring a sense of curiosity, a sense of energy and a sense of like determination. Like I want to contribute to this problem. And so I think that's part of the first part of the conversation um, about like getting a foot in the door is like really being able to communicate, like here are the skills that I have and here's what I bring to the party. And this is why you need me. Um, and making that case is something that is like a skill best learned as early as possible. Um, because, you know, so much of, so much of community and like getting a job these days is partially network. And so by building your network and explaining and knowing your worth and communicating your worth is really important. Um, and so I think that's probably the best thing that I can say about foot in the door is knowing your worth and being able to communicate what you bring to the party. Onye, is that something that resonates with, with your... Um... Yeah, yeah, as, as Dr. Bryson was speaking, I was, that definitely resonates with me a lot. And I, I think I would add to that, in addition to figuring out, you know, what is your mission? What is your life mission? What is your scientific mission? Is once you figure that out, because that's how you tell yourself as what you're going to contribute to academia, is then to look out for different mentors, especially as a junior faculty member. That's what I'm looking for as I'm trying to put my foot into the door in academia and to reach out to different people, who senior faculty members, or maybe my peers who have different skills that I feel like I need to develop or maybe they're working on something and I feel like there's a way for us to collaborate. So I feel like that's been one of the things that I've tried to do in order to keep my career in academia healthy. And then the other thing is, you know, part of my mission I feel is to try to encourage as many people 
from all sorts of diverse backgrounds to get excited about immunology. I love immunology so much. And so having that as like a driver um, has also made my path or my, the beginnings of my path with a career in academia exciting. Cause I'm trying to look out for people, you know, undergrads, other graduate students, other postdocs and figure out how can I share with them some of the tips and pointers that have helped me and then see them grow and hopefully like surpass me and solve the problem of all food allergies, you know, or, or something. So that's kind of where, what moves me in academia. Asher, I think you've been involved as well during your graduate uh, time in, in a lot of activism on campus. Can you can share about that as well? Yeah, so uh, like I said, I think that came from just feeling like we wanted to foster a greater sense of community on campus. And so we um, developed the, the Black Graduate Student Association and uh, tried to bring people together across campus for events and professional development and networking um, events as well. Um, and a lot of it, in terms of structural changes with the administration, we did have to um, kind of be very diplomatic in terms of proposing changes that we thought would um, be helpful for minority students and just minor things that they could do to, to make the environment on campus a little bit better for us. So yeah, I think it's it's a matter of, you know, finding the right people to connect with and having sort of a vision of what you want to achieve and then sell that vision to the people who can actually make those changes. Thanks for sharing about that. About, you know, changing the environment and the culture, um, the last year has been bringing a lot of, I would say, look at the positive aspect of it, a lot of new energy into, into changing the culture in our research communities. Um, can you share about what you've seen changing in the last six months and, and that you were not necessarily expecting to change and, and that you know, brings hope that things might actually this time change in a more dramatic way? I guess I can start. Um, you know, there are things, there are many things that bring me hope. Um, one is the willingness to have the conversation, like a lot of people, and have the conversation with all kinds of folks, because like um, many of us on the screen might have been having these conversations with people who look like us our whole lives, let's be real. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that like other people are like participating in the conversation, listening, taking notes, doing the extra work that they need to do to like learn the history and learn all of the uh, experiences um, of others by reading and doing the, doing the research just as they would if they were researching kind of their own kind of academic interests. And so um, I think that that is a really positive sign. I think the commitment to transparency about like how things, how decisions are made is really also important um, in terms of, okay, what, what, is our, what do our hiring practices look like? What do our graduate admissions practices look like? What, do, what are all of our practices and how do we make those, make sure that we're not missing people um, in the construction of our, our process? Because like history shows us, right? If you don't write people into the process, you have to correct the, you have to correct it at a later date. And so if we are thinking about kind of a new academic constitution, so to speak, everybody needs to be at the table to do that. So we don't have to then do 17 different amendments to actually be able to like actually get to closer to equity. And we see what that looks like right now. Like we're still not there in a, as a country. So we need people at the table and listening uh, and understanding what everybody needs to be able to move things forward more equitably. Thank you so much for that. Let's move to another point and, and maybe more focused about, you know, um, what, what, what's common in, in, in this panel. Um, let's talk about innovation and technology, uh, whether it's bioengineering uh, in your background or in your current research or immunotherapeutic development, um, you all have acquired skill sets that are not very common. 
So can you share all about what what was taking this route accidental or actually pre premeditated for you all? Um, and also uh, what what acquiring the skill set looks like for you? Was it actually difficult? I think we were thinking that you know in this field of technology and innovation, there is a, a steep learning curve. Um, some people might feel like it's it's really difficult to get these skills. Um, so yeah, can you share about about that? Yes, I can start by talking about how I stumbled into the field of Africa syndrome. Um, and it's funny because it was really by mistake. So in graduate school, I had briefly worked with invariant natural killer T cells. And you know, their, their canonical antigen is this alpha galactosir ceramide. So then, you know, I went, finished graduate school, went through med school, did my residency, and then matched at UNC for my allergy immunology fellowship. At the same time, Scott Cummings, who's one of the premier experts in Alpha-Gal syndrome, was recruited from UVA down to UNC. And, you know, so we were seeing a lot of his patients since they were coming to see him especially. And I was like, alpha syndrome. So I thought actually that it was alpha-galactosylceramide that was the antigen. I was like, NKT cells have to be involved in this in some way. And that's actually what piqued my interest and got me involved in this. Come to find that there, it's two co completely different things because it's a galactose, alpha-1-3 galactose. I still think that there may be a role for NKT cells and maybe more on that. Um, but that's kind of how I stumbled into trying to figure out what was going on with this very strange food allergy. And I think in terms of a skill set, so you know, in graduate school, um, I used mice. Like I was learning to model things using mouse models and to be a cellular immunologist. And to jump into Alpha-Gal syndrome, we didn't really have a mouse model when I started to work in Scott Cummings' lab. And we were working primarily with patients and with study subjects, human subjects. So learning how you go about recruiting human beings you know, and convincing them to participate in studies, to donate their samples and set up um, systems that allow you to explore immunological questions that are really with a human focus, that was a new skill set for me and I'm still learning. I can add in a little bit and then jump on that. So I was refraining from talking about the NKT cell antigen alpha gal serum because I didn't want to bring on that confusion. Um, but it has been very interesting for me as well. And I talked about it just a tiny bit that my PhD work was in viral immunology. And then I did a short postdoc in transplant. And then I went to a uh, bioengineering lab. And so my postdoc advisor, my second postdoc advisor at Hopkins has pioneered the field of these artificial antigen presenting complexes and he's made them for CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells. And he was interested in lipid presentation. So that's why I was brought in. And so it was a great fit uh, for me to be able to expand my repertoire, but I hadn't done any work looking at um, engineering, and he wanted to know how many complexes does it take to drive a specific immune reaction? And he was like, that's a great question. Um, I'll work on it. You know, I'll try. And just looking at the avidity and affinity and how that would trigger different responses. And um, again, I briefly mentioned that NKT cells can make uh, Th1, Th2, Th17 type cytokines. And so that can depend on the ligand or the antigen that's loaded, the co-stimulatory molecule that's added, and how long you have the interaction. And so I hadn't really thought about how to measure these types of things and then how to assess them and then moving to the nanoparticle-based formulation. Again, how many proteins can bind and what does that mean? And how does the orientation of the protein impact the ability of the cell to be activated? So all of these things are important, uh, but if you don't really work in that area or you haven't thought about things from an engineering perspective, and then I wanted to make uh, biodegradable nanoparticles, right, for in vivo, because um, while the Q dots are fantastic, having that metallic bead-based form would not really be a therapeutic option. Right, so there's, it's been a steep learning curve all the way throughout. And now it's been really fantastic because when people come into my lab, we can do pretty much whatever you want. I mean, it's within our lab framework. You know what I mean? It's not just in, but if you want to work with cellular immunology, if you want to work with molecular biology, if you want to do more human translational based stuff, if you want to do more engineering type projects, 
it's been fantastic because we can do all of those types of things. Awesome. So basically acquiring skill set based on your scientific questions and, and just figuring it out. That, that's really awesome. Um, what about the other? Ryan, now did you uh, get into computational and and and, and um, the science, I guess? Yeah, so um, it's an interesting question because, you know, my journey um, actually started very classically trained as an engineer. So, you know, I, my undergrad degree is in mechanical engineering um, and I built robots um, or I built one robot and I said, this is not for me. Um, and I was like, nope, got to find something else. And what I realized is that I liked engineering principles, but I liked them applied to biological problems. And so, you know, the the kind of arc of my career thus far has been hearing about an interesting biological problem and then deciding that, again, I have something I want to bring to the party. Um, and, you know, right now I will say that uh, innate immunology and immunology writ large and the intersection of data, um, open unanswered questions and kind of MacGyvering your, I, the thing I love about engineering, I, I have to say is like, you know, people say like, this is really hard. And then the engineer is like, put me in coach, right? It's just like, you're just like, okay, cool. Like, I'm gonna like figure out a way to address this problem because engineers see like a problem and there's like, there is an engineering solution and you just need to figure out what that is. And so that's kind of like how I find myself professionally is like, I love really difficult problems and the problems of infectious diseases are really important and really difficult as we have learned the hard way. Um, so that's what I'll say. Asher, what about you? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm a, a chemical engineer. And uh, I think throughout my career, I've been involved in sort of these side projects that involve developing new technologies. So when I worked at NASA, that was about developing like a, a new disposable bioreactor system for producing nutrients in space. And then during my PhD, well, I guess all of the, the work that you do in your PhD is novel, but when I worked at an internship towards the end of my PhD, I also worked on developing like a new platform for um, downstream processing of, of gene therapy products. So uh, in my postdoc, it's kind of in a similar stream, you know, developing a new technology, platform technology for producing these vaccines. And it's along the lines of areas that I'm interested in, bioengineering, and still within the realm of chemical engineering, but I'm just stepping over into the, the immunology space. So uh, I think it's been almost happenstance, I think, some aspects of, of my journey, just having really good mentors who uh, encouraged me to apply for things that I didn't think I was qualified for or, um, just having people encourage your ideas and, and support your journey. So uh, that, that's kind of been the, the pathway for me. But it's really interesting to hear from the other three panelists about their journeys as professors, like how they, they got into their fields and came up with their ideas. I think it's some really good insights. So thanks for sharing that also. Yeah. Some of you in the room are developing new therapeutic strategies that are, um, you know, that might be difficult to be accepted as, as um, on the market. And you mentioned, Tonya, that the metal league beads are not going to fly um, if we want to put them in humans. And, and so all these new approaches, even the cell-free um, bioengineering, um, uh, all these new approaches are difficult to be um, translated into a treatment that goes on, on, the, on the market. And, and we're seeing a discussion going on with um, the vaccines development uh, for COVID, for example, that have you know, different um, characteristics. And can you share a little bit about, you know, um, how going about these new approaches that are gonna make these treatments more, um, that are gonna make these treatments better, but at the same time, the market might it might be difficult to put them on the market and, and to make them in treatment that are out there. Uh, 
Sorry, I wasn't sure if that was a question directed at me or was it for the entire panel? <laughs> for everyone, yeah, for everyone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the thing about new technologies is that you, you kind of have to convince people that they're, well, of course, the science has to be good, so it has to be effective, and then safety is always a big concern with, with anything that's new. Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of educating the public just so that they can understand maybe like the mechanism or, or what this, uh, this new drug is actually going to do to their system. And I think once you have that understanding, it kind of eliminates some of the, the aspects of fear that people tend to have around new technologies. Yeah, I would agree with that. And in the case of alpha syndrome, so one of the biggest questions is, you know, how can we deal with this? We can do something to change the host, but, or we can actually do something to change the food, you know, that the, the alpha gal allergic person is eating. And so, there actually exists um, pigs that are essentially alpha-gal knockout pigs. So they don't have the enzyme in order to make that galactose alpha-1 to galactose linkage. And so they were created uh, maybe a couple of decades ago with the thought that they could provide organs you know, for transplant um, individuals to not reject their transplanted, xenotransplanted organs. Now people are resurrecting them and thinking about them as a possible alpha-gal safe food source. And so I feel like one of the ways to encourage um, the pop general population to, to embrace new technologies goes with what Dr. Williams was saying. You need to generate excitement and then put out a lot of information about the technology. And then you have to uh, reassure the public that you're going to test this in a very rigorous manner. So in the case of these alpha-gal safe pigs as a possible source of meat for people with the meat allergy, you know, we don't just throw that out there. It's, they're going to be tested with individuals who are signing up with full consent to see whether or not it's safe in them first before you start figuring out how to mass produce and market. So I think it's generating excitement about the idea and at the same time, reassuring the public that things are going to be rigorously tested before they're deployed widely. Sydney, what about you? You, you have uh, created the biotech that is developing uh, immunotherapy strategies. Um, what, what are the difficulties that, that you find on the south? Um, so I feel that um, you have to really understand the market. It seems very, very different compared to academia because I'll go in with my enthusiasm and excitement about the science. And it seems that um, investors believe the science there, like that's your expertise, but how much is it going to cost? What do people need and how does it fill a gap? What hole are you addressing? And then who's doing anything similar to it? And why is yours better? And again, um, really just understanding what is needed, what the holes are, and then again, product development and the cost. So I feel like it's a completely different side. And when I'm like, oh, I have this, we've made this uh, technology and it's and they're like, okay, uh, that's great. And so while I feel that in academia, we're really trying to sell the science, um, it really like to move it forward, they want to know about what is the demand for this, whatever you have, what is the need? And then how can you fulfill that need? Is your, whatever you have, is that the best thing available to fill the gap? And so it kind of switches the structure of the way that you present the work. And so I would give advice to anyone who's moving into that space to really understand what's out there in the competitive landscape. And again, in academia, academia, you read the papers, you know the literature, you know your collaborators, you know your competitors, who's out there. But to frame that in a way where investors understand what you need and uh, what, I mean, well, what you're providing, then um, that's, I think, the best way uh, to move forward. And again, it's a completely different way of viewing your science. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing about that. It is 
unfortunately already time I, I would have uh, wanted to stay on and, and continue to discuss with our fantastic uh, panelists. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining and, and giving us amazing presentations and inspirational um, talks, uh, along with giving us a lot of uh, your insight on, on uh, how your journey has been uh, informing you into what you're doing right now. Um, I want to thank everyone that has been um, organizing Black Union Week. Black Union Week continues with uh, additional days that are gonna be more social media focused. So stay on and continue to share on social media about our your journeys and, and to create connections. Um, Black Union is all about creating connections. So we'll 